Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 796, with my guest today, Kyoshi Eric Menard. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I founded Whistlekick, and I host this show because I love traditional martial arts, and I love traditional martial artists, people like you. And if you are like me at all, you are aligned in our mission to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world because you agree with me that people who train become better versions of themselves. And what better way to help the world than to get people to train? Okay. If you want to see all the things that we're doing to get people to train or keep them training, go to whistlekick.com. Look at all the products and projects we have going. And one of the things you'll find over there is, of course, our store. It's the main way that we pay the bills here. And if you use the code PODCAST15, it's going to save you 15% on a new shirt or a hoodie or a hat or some protective gear or a training program or all kinds of other stuff that we do. So check that out. And if you want to go a little bit further on these episodes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go. We've got 795 other episodes that we've done. You'll get access to all of them. Show notes, transcripts, all kinds of good stuff at that website. Now, if what we do means something to you, if you want to support us, and I know a lot of you out there are already doing things to support us, and I appreciate you. Well, you could buy something. You could leave a review anywhere that seems logical, or you could join our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. Starts at two bucks a month, and we've got tiers 5, 10, 25, 50, and 100, and at each tier, you get more and more. We deliver overwhelming value. If you have a martial arts school, it's deductible because of the stuff that we're giving you back. It is beneficial to your school. If you are not a school owner, well, you're going to find a tremendous amount of entertainment value in what we are delivering to you, as well as just more thoughtful, intentional content like you get from this show. If you like this show, you will like what we do on Patreon. And the folks that join are nodding along right now, I'm sure. They know that because they join and they don't stop. So go check that out, patreon.com slash whistlekick. If you want all the list of things, a list of things that you can do to help us out in our mission, to help us grow, whistlekick.com slash family. You got to go type that in. But there's no link to it. We put that tiny little hurdle in front of you because, well, we give you some great stuff on the other side, and we want to make sure that you mean to go there, that it's not an accident. Whistlekick.com slash family. If you're part of the family, you're probably already checking out that page. Now, speaking of family, Kyoshi Menard, today's guest, is kind of what we're we're connected. We're connected in so many ways. Yet, this is the longest conversation I've had with him. In fact, I'd only met him once before. We were at a lunch with some others, and it went really well. I, I just really enjoyed talking with him. And I said, you know, we got to get him on the show. So now he's on the show. We had a wonderful conversation. And we're talking about, I guess, the word I would sum it up with is destiny. We talk about his destiny from a very early age. I hope you enjoy the episode, and I will see you on the other side. No worries. No worries. How's it going? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm well. Good. Thanks I for doing this. a little late because I clicked on it and said I needed to update stuff. So I was... oh, always the way. Yeah. Always the way. Yeah. So snowing whenever, whenever you need something. Yeah. Is it snowing something. where you are now? It wasn't when I closed the curtains. Yeah. Uh, we're supposed to get... When, when, when's it scheduled to come? Because you're in... Nashua. You're, yeah. So... I'd get it, you know, an hour before you. Yeah, it's snow. It's snowing a little bit now. Is it really? Oh, yeah. Funny. Okay. Well, then maybe we're not actually getting this one. So I'm not. We're not supposed to get anything until tonight. Awesome. Hi. Hey. I'm ready. I'm ready for it to be done. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Give me like a good solid two months of snow. Anything after that, I, I don't think. Mm -hmm. it. So. Uh, we got a choice at this point, and it's entirely up to you. We can just plow ahead, or we can kind of press pause, and we can chat off on the side if you have questions or concerns or anything. Um, no, I've never really done anything like this, so perfect. Your hands, you kind of. I was talking to uh, Craig, so well, he, he'll kind of lead the way, ask questions, and yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just two people having conversation about martial arts, but you're doing most of the talking. Right. That's right. really, that's, that's, that's all it is. Yeah. You lead the way. I can answer the all question. Right. Awesome. Right. Well, then, then let's, let's jump in. I know a very small amount of your background, so we can start there. Right. When did you get started? Um, 
technically 1982. Mm -hmm. I had, um, that's when I met my instructor, Bobby Lamantina. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I was doing some Taekwondo as a kid. So this was like seventh grade, seventh, eighth, ninth grade. Um, a friend of mine got into a fight in school and his father got him into martial arts. His mm -hmm. grandfather or uncle at the time, I believe was like, um, a lieutenant in the police of Nashua or a chief of police. I can't remember what his, um, what he was, but he had knew this, knew this guy, uh, this guy, his name was Glenn. It was Glenn's Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. And I had called him. I saved my money from my paper route, called him a couple of times. And um, just talking to him over the phone, I just fell right into the martial arts. His, he was so inviting. And mm -hmm. we went there and I started training there for like three or four months. And then um, when I got out of that, I did some other things and then went, I found my instructor and that's where I've been ever since. Yeah. Was it entirely the, the fight that happened at school that put you on that path? I mean, I, I would imagine um, that you are, were aware of martial arts before. No, it, it was both. It was I, the fight because my friend got into it and I wanted to do it. I, when I was mm -hmm. a kid, I like, you know, you dream about what you want to do. Sure. So like, I had a couple things. One, I wanted to go into the military, fly a jet plane, which didn't happen. <laughs> wanted to be like Spider-Man and climb walls, which I do rock climbing, so I can I accomplish there you that. Go. And as a kid, I wanted to be like James Bond. So well, who, some who of those didn't? things. Yeah, some yeah. of those things happened, some didn't. So karate was a big part. Um, mm -hmm. I always liked it from early on. I didn't, I was a um, small kid, so I wasn't really big. Mm -hmm. Um, but I always liked it. I seen it on TV. I never knew I could do it. Um, my parents didn't have the money to pay for it. So I had, at the time I had paper routes and money for Christmas and sure. relatives. I said, well, I, this is what I want for Christmas. And everyone pitched in. So I had enough money to start. So it was, wasn't just the fight. It was something I wanted to do anyways. Sure. Now I find that you know, not everyone started at an age that they're really going to remember. I started, I was um, certainly younger than you. I don't remember much at all. I certainly don't remember my first class, mm -hmm. but I'm going to guess that you do. Most of the guests on the show, if they're old enough, remember their first class. And I'm wondering what that felt like. Well, so it was like seventh grade, eighth grade. So 13 or 14. Yeah. Um, so I went to, when I did Glenn's Taekwondo, it, you come into the school and it was um, in the basement of, um, it used to be the old YMCA in Nashua like a hundred years ago. So it's mm -hmm. down the basement. Um, you walk in and you walk down into the, the dojo area and um, the classes, everyone's in the same class, kids to adults. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of kids. There were some young kids, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. And as a white belt, you're in the back. You line up black belts, you go by rank, so white belts mm -hmm. at the end. And um and I was young, so it's two hour class and um the first hour is conditioning and whatever we did, then the last part sparring or self-defense. And then as a kid, you at the time we didn't have a lot of equipment, so you had to fight everybody and you're fighting adults and things like that. And it was tough because I was a kid and they were adults and there wasn't a lot of control. Um, sure. so that was my first class there and it was crazy. And Mr. Glenn was a jolly guy, big guy. He was, um, retired police officer. He would sit up front. He would smoke his cigarettes and teach class. <laughs> <laughs> That's a first that I have not heard of. Yeah. It was funny. It was at the time you, you didn't think about it, but now, right. you know, years later teaching, going to all these seminars about how to teach a class and how to run your school, you sit back <laughs> and you look. And it's like, okay, he sat there up front in his chair, barking up commands. And um, it, it was fun. It was it was an enjoyable time. I mean, it was painful sometimes. Sure. To the younger folks who might be watching or listening, um, and, and, and you can't wrap your head around this, remember, this was a time when we had smoking sections on airplanes. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's, that's what we thought needed to happen. So a um, yeah. little bit of a different understanding these days. Of yeah. So there was, no, there was no, like, not smoking in the building and stuff <laughs> like that. Wherever you went, you've seen it as a kid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my parents smoked, so I it wasn't something that I didn't know of. 
um, it's not nothing I did, but um, it was something that we lived with. So right. it wasn't, it wasn't, oh, well, that's weird. Everybody's parents smoked back then. Yeah, it, it wasn't I, I, weird. It I was, remember, uh, I remember it was weird when I met, you know, when I was at a friend's house and their parents didn't smoke. Yeah. Or even one of their parents didn't smoke. Right? Yeah. So here you are, you're you're in this, um, is it fair to say, kind of authoritative culture? You know, you described the, the way he was sitting in the chair, barking out commands. Yeah. You know, sounds kind of old school. Yeah. Did that work for you at that age? Yeah, because, um, again, I wanted to be in the military, so... Mm. I don't know if that if that was my thinking at the time, but I enjoyed it. I mean, it was tough, um, especially when you're a white belt and you you're learning your first form. It was really hard. Now I do a form I can kind of visualize it, but like in Taekwondo, you learn the first form, which is basically the first form in most styles. One for me, one pinion. It's the same H pattern or I pattern, mm -hmm. depending how you look at it. Was was this a in ITF school? No, it was um, Glenn's Taekwondo. Um, it might have been ATF. It, I don't think he was affiliated. I can't remember. Okay. okay. Um, but um, I know we did um, um, the one pinyon was, um, I can't remember the Korean name for it. Chungji? Yeah, Chungji. Okay. So um, that's what we did. And I remember trying to do it and... Um, I couldn't wrap my head around it. I kept looking at my feet and watching where I was going. And it just was a really tough time. I couldn't visualize it. And then sure. it clicked somewhere. And I was able to kind of visualize some of the moves and not mm -hmm. look at my feet and go through the form. Um, whether I figured that out then or when I was with my other instructor, um, I don't know when that happened, but once that happened, it was easier to go through the form and learn it and just visualize. I started visualizing things. I mean, forms were still difficult to visualize. You have to really, I had to really sit down and visualize things. Mm -hmm. I'm more of a kinesthetic learner. I have to do, I have to see it, but I have to do it yep. to, to really grasp it. So um, at that time, it was, you know, I was young, I was new to what we were doing. I had never done anything. I wasn't really that physical. I mean, I mm. went out and played and stuff like that, but I sure. wasn't a sports mm -hmm. pro. I, I didn't do any sports or anything. Okay. So um, it was fun with that. And it, it was kind of that authoritarian thing, which was kind of good for me. I, I liked it. Mm. Okay. And it sounds like you kept going. Now, I know at one point, you know, a little bit of a spoiler alert, you ended up with a different instructor. Yeah. Is, is that the next point in, in the timeline that maybe we talk about? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what, what was it What was it that caused that? Um, what well, was money? I, I was young. I was, like I said, seventh, eighth grade. Um, I had a paper route for a while, and then that's why I made a lot of the money. And then um, when I was at Glenn's, it was um, $150 for three months. So I saved the money I had. Christmas was coming. I got it. That's from a lot for back then. $150 for three months. Back, no, was, back so in the like, 80s? Yeah, it was like $50 a month. So it was $150 for three months. Wow. And I remember hmm. that. And then um, so... It might have been more because I went to Tokyo Joe's at the time it was Fred Valari's. Mm -hmm. I think we were paying a month was like 25 bucks or 30 bucks right. a month. So that's and, what I was more used to yeah. when we talk about that timeline. Yeah. And maybe it might have been more or less at Glenn's, but it was just a package deal. It was three months special. Yep. Um, and maybe I got it because I mentioned my friend because um, he went there. Mm -hmm. um i can't remember how that happened but so it was the three months so i collected the money i got it from you know my godmother and godfather they were always helping me out with stuff so um i had the money paid i did the three months and then i didn't i didn't see any way to get any more money so we i stopped and then um i was introduced to my instructor mr Martina, and then um 
I he just made it easy to get in there. I was mm. helping out, and um, when I met him, I knew. How did you meet him? Um, I was introduced to him by a friend of mine, um, my friend Jim. He uh, he was training with him. He was kind of like his first student, but I was mm-hmm. the first black belt that he produced from. He came from East Boston, so he had a school in Boston. He was teaching. When he moved up here, it was brand new, so he didn't have anyone. Okay. So, so one thing I want I want to add on because folks who are 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 in the audience right now, um, th- this is a figure who is very well known in the New England area. This is someone who's been around for a long time, yeah. and what you're talking about is the very very early stages yeah. of his instructional career. He's turned out quite a few black belts, and and um, quite a few people have gone on to run schools. So I, I think yeah. that's important for folks to know. Please continue. Yes, yeah, at the time he um he was running a school in East Boston and um, before he came up. So he had, that was where he started. He was already Mm -hmm. in the Fred Valeri system, well-known in Boston area and stuff like that. Coming up to New Hampshire was, um, he was like 22. So it was a new thing for him. Sure. Running a school by himself. um, I'm assuming that was, that was new to him as well. I mean, he had the background and he had the skill to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was good at talking to people and he was good at especially teaching i mean we had you know over the years he trained a lot of people some of them like you said went on to other things some opened schools some didn't um couple like mike Pomberio went off to mm-hmm. john paul mitchell team yep. um in california and stuff like that so um there was a lot of good fighters at the time we we fought a lot and there was um and that was um, that was a tough thing for me because I was smaller than everyone, mm. and the kids that the guys we trained, the kids that we trained with, they were all. Neither you nor mm. I have found a way to overcome that as we've aged. Yeah, we're we're, we're still smaller. Yeah, yeah, it, it was just it was hard because these kids were, and not some of them were bigger than me, but not a lot. But they were, um, they grew up in a, a different kind of neighborhoods. They were used to getting in fights a lot. Some of them were, we called them street fighters. They were, they were, and some of them were, I remember one of my friends, kid Nathan, um, tall, lanky. Uh, he was quick as a cat. He, and he was, <clears throat> when he got into it, he was, I was a higher belt and he was like a purple belt or something. But I remember he was just so quick and agile. It was like, how do you, how do you beat that? How do you defend mm. him? He was just so quick. It was funny because he was just so quick at everything and it was just a pleasure to work with him and, um, and just learn how to deal with something like that. And it's just a totally different experience and stuff. So, um, that time was, was good in the beginning. And I knew like the first or second day when I met my instructor, Mr. Lamartino, we, we were talking or something and he said something or something happened. And I, and I knew right then, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach karate and I would be with him for a long time. Mm-hmm. I just knew this is what I'm going to do. So I had to figure out how to gear myself to be able to run a school. So yeah, yeah. first was training. I trained all the time. I, um, I didn't, I didn't do any other sports except wrestling. So, mm-hmm. um, I didn't have a lot of other activities. In my house, I, I lived close enough where I could walk down to the school. He was down on off Main Street where we lived up uh, in Nashville. We lived up on Conquer Street, which was um, the north end. Was, um, years, probably 100 years ago, all the big houses, the mansions and things like that. So we lived right before that, what they call um, French Hill, where all the French people lived. Um, so we were right before that. So we were right on the cusp of that. Mm-hmm. So... Um, that's where everyone knew everyone knew that was and they call hey i live in french hill so that's that area there so it was just um a 10 15 minute 20 minute walk down main street to my classes so um it was easy to get for me to get there after school and stuff so i would go after school and train um i'd get there early warm up train do my classes or help teach classes even as a white belt i was cuz he didn't have a lot of instructors he had this one um a friend, his kid was Lenny, Lenny LaDuke. He was a, when I met him, he was a brown belt, but he had studied 
um, in Nashua, there was another school called um, Monkai, the way of the monkey. This guy, Mark West. Okay. Um, he was awesome. I, <laughs> everyone was, um, he's almost, he almost reminds you of Johnny Cash. Cause every time you would see him, he was dressed in black, black hat, like, um, like Johnny Cash would wear. Yeah. Um, quiet, really quiet. Um, when I first met him, um, it was, you have to remember back then it was kind of, it was kind of wild. I mean, people, you know, the karate people were, um, everyone thought they were like supermen, especially yeah. like for me as a kid, I thought my instructor, I put him up on a pedestal and this guy, Mark here, um, I still see him from time to time and we're good friends. We talk, um, but there was all kinds of stories about him. He was in Vietnam and stuff. He was a tunnel rat and he was really, um, I'm not sure how true all that stuff was, but um, it, it was a kind of a wild time. And um, so everyone would like, oh, be careful of him. He's like really good. No one would, you wouldn't give him any crap. You wouldn't insult him. You wouldn't, mm -hmm. you know, because at the time, like now, like I train with Jesse, I train with Terry, Craig, and all these people. Jesse Dwyer, yeah. Terry Dow, Craig Wareham, all of whom have been yeah. on the show. So I train, we were in a group, we trained together, but 20, you know, in the 80s when I trained, trust training wasn't really allowed. I remember one time <laughs> me and my friends went to another Fred Valary school. It was in Derry, I think, just to do sparring or something because we wanted to just meet other people. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, when, uh, when our instructor find out about it, he wasn't too happy. Um, so we had a little talk to, but, um, so at that time, cross training or, or talking to other schools wasn't kind of a good thing, but then eventually, so Lenny's teaching, but he also trains with Mark West and mm -hmm. he met my friend, my instructor and, um, you know, he wanted to train with him. So he was helping teach as well. So I remember my first day as a quote white belt because I had done the Taekwondo. So I was a little above a white belt, but mm -hmm. not, not nearly a brown belt. So my first day was sparring with a brown belt mm. and getting kind of beat up a bit. <laughs> but um, he became a good friend and stuff. Unfortunately, he passed away several years ago. But um, um the training we did and it was a lot of some of the people from mark's school a couple of them trained at our school as well and they were going back and forth so i think that's kind of when i when we started kind of cross training and doing other things with other schools yeah well especially with them we would go and spar with them he had a little gym up on top of main street above a pizza place it was uh he had a boxing ring he had weights and it was kind of cool and nice. um wasn't as commercial as Miss Lomatina school at the time or the schools now, but um, it was good training. We, we did, it was all about fighting. We went there and just fought. And that's all it was. And, did uh, your attitude towards sparring change? Yeah, it did. After a while, I had a friend, one of the adults, he was, um, he was older. He, um, he drove taxi. Eventually, he bought the taxi company right across from the karate school. Hmm. He was um, he was a black belt in Korea. He um, he was in the army in Korea, and at the time, um, they got their black belts really quick because the Koreans were training them. And um, so he pulled me aside and worked with me for a while on um, like getting better at my kicks. Like I would go up and down the dojo doing um, front leg kicks, like side kicks, round kicks, hook kicks, kind of like um, the Bill Wallace system. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that before I even met him. So I had the same kicking style as he does, not as good as he does, but none um, of us are as good as he yeah. does. <laughs> uh, even now when I watch him, when I train with him, when he's around, he's like in his seventies or something. He's mm -hmm. like, how, how does he do that stuff? And it's just crazy. So I would spend hours going up and down the dojo floor. And my friend, the guy, John, his name was Jonathan, Jonathan Butler. That's what it was. Um, he would help me do those kicks. I would do like sliding kicks. I would do side kicks down and back like three times. And then round kicks, same thing, then hook kicks. And I would combine them all together. So I started getting better at that. 
So before that, when I was sparring, I was um, I was doing all right, but I was getting bullied because the kids were bigger, and, and not not on purpose. They were just walking through me, and they didn't really respect what I was doing. You know, they just walked through me. Mm-hmm. So then I started um, getting better at kicking. And I remember um, not so vividly, but I remember sparring and just hitting a couple people with some side kicks and round kicks and hook kicks, and then. It was like, oh, we have to pay attention to him now because now he can hurt us. Hmm. And I found that. And um, so I just kind of worked on that. And my sparring got better. Not um, – it got better. And, mm-hmm. I, you know, I like sparring, but it's not – it wasn't a big thing because I did a lot of solo training for myself, um, like when I was helping him teach. So on Saturday, he would close early, and Sunday, he'd be closed. So I'd have a key. I'd go down. I would stay Saturday after he left till about 4 or 5 o'clock and just train by myself. Katas, weapons, Mm -hmm. kicking drills, just on the bag or up and down the dojo. Sunday, since I didn't have a whole lot to do, I would uh, probably get down there around noon Mm -hmm. and train until um, like 5. How old old are you at this point? You're 16, Um, 17? Uh, probably a little younger than that, okay. probably um, 15, 16. Okay. Um, so I graduated in 84. I was, what, 19, I believe. I went into the military like three days after that. So, And I started martial arts in 82. I got my black belt in 84. So um, probably like 15, 16, 17. Okay. Okay. I know the military piece is, is significant. We've t- we've hinted at it a couple of times, but before yeah. we go there, there's one piece I want to go back to because mm-hmm. I think it's pretty significant. And if if folks were not around at this time, you may not realize that it was it was a big deal. So you talked about Mr. Lamatino being 22 when you met him and mm-hmm. opening a school. That was something that very rarely happened. I didn't know anyone who was opening schools at that age back yeah. then. We haven't had folks on. I think we might have had one or two others on the show who opened schools really early. Because remember, in order to do that, you had to start training as a kid. And through the 60s and even into the 70s, training as a kid was uncommon. Yeah. But here we have someone who you instantly connected with. You're younger, kind of like a big brother age. Yeah. And and I think... I'm going to guess that there was some significance in there with you seeing a path. You you mentioned that you knew very quickly yeah. you wanted to open a school after meeting him. Yeah. Um, he was 22. I was probably what, maybe I was 17. He's probably like three or four years older than me. So yeah, he was, um, he was kind of like a big brother, mm. but um, maybe not that, but um, a role model at the time. Mm. Um, not parental age dynamic yeah. which is what we often see with, with yeah kids training and then yeah their instructors yeah um so some story about that um so yeah i wanted once i met him i knew this is my path i wanted to do this i wanted to go into the military i wanted to do this um i just didn't know how i was going to do it so i started mm-hmm. figuring out okay well if i'm going to teach martial arts I get good at what I do. So I trained harder and I said, well, watching him run the business and, um, you know, he was so versatile. He could do katas, he could fight. That was his thing. And he could do weapons. And like the first, one of the first weapons I seen him use was probably, uh, the nunchucks or the bullwhip. So, mm. um, bullwhip. Yeah. He would, um, he would play with that. And, um, oh, cool. And, you know, there was no no forms or anything at the time. He would just kind of snap that thing around, and it was just crazy to watch him. Um, and then uh, the stuff he, he used to do, it was some of it you don't want to talk about. It was just funny. <laughs> um, during yeah. testing and stuff, it was just – it was funny. Um, for us, it was just the normal day, the way we trained. And like you talked about when I was with Glenn, Glenn's Taekwondo, you talked about the militant stuff and – the old time school, the old time stuff. That's what it was when we when I met him. That's how that's how classes were. It was old school. Um, his dojo didn't have any mats. Had carpet on a wood or cement floor. I can't remember what. I think it was like a wooden floor because it was an old building. Um, but um, yeah, so I 
kind of geared myself, okay, getting better at my martial arts. That's the first thing. Okay, weapons. Well, if I want to have a school, maybe I want to do seminars or teach weapons, so I have to learn weapons. So I started accumulating that. Nunchucks, um, bow staff, calm as a sword. I remember, um, and as time goes along, like you said, he was 22 when he opened his school. I was one of the first ones. Oh, actually, I was the first one of his students to open schools. We had a, a small satellite school in Hudson hmm. right before um, I went into the military. And um, me and my friend David, the one that got me into Taekwondo, that was in Taekwondo with me, he had come over to Tokes, so I got him over there. And um, we had both got our black belts at the same time. Mm -hmm. And he was doing other things. He was going on. He got a job. He, um, he's a plumber now, a master plumber, owns his own business. So he didn't, he, after black belt, he kind of stopped and stuff after I went to the military. But um, the point was, is so we opened up the school in Hudson and I would go teach it. He would teach it. We had, um, he had an office manager, some, uh, one of the young ladies that um, was teaching at the, was working at the school. She was like a green belt or something. And she would do the office stuff part-time and I would teach. It was a small, it was small, probably a little bit bigger than the room you're in now. Um, mm -hmm. It was small, had sharp shag carpet and they stick carpeting. It was funny. <laughs> Um, it's just one room, tiny, tiny changing room, tiny office. And um, so I started teaching there before I went into the army. And then, um, and we had, um, we had a good, we had some good, we had like probably 30, 40 students maybe. Before how, how did, how did that feel? Because again, we're, we're following this path of you, you know, finding martial arts young, feeling like this is your path. Yeah. And here's really your first opportunity to step out and teach I mean, not your own space, but not yeah. your instructor space, certainly. Was it what you expected or hoped it to be? Yeah, no, it was It was scary. It was because, one, you know, I was... Basically, I'm kind of a shy person. Mm -hmm. In the dojo, you, you probably won't believe that if you see me train or interact with people. Um, just because it's my, it's my comfort zone. But outside, I'm usually typically, in attending who I'm with and the people I'm with, it depends on stuff like that. But typically, I was. So in the dojo, I, I wasn't too bad. But I remember, and I think I talked about this to someone before, I was young. I was 16, 17. I had some adults in class that were older than me. Yeah. So teaching being young like that and teaching older people was kind of a challenge too sometimes mm -hmm. um i think at first it might have been but then I, I got more comfortable with it like even um i remember one time in the dojo i was teaching i was young probably what 17 18 teaching and i'm teaching and like i said the carpet was really thick it was like a sh shag carpet nice and it's not typically what you'd have in a dojo mm -hmm. um so I'm teaching a, a sidekick, a sliding sidekick. And there's two young ladies in class and a bunch of people. So I do the kick and I slip and I just fall and I slap down. And I go, and I go, wow, look at that. And I do a like a ground sidekick, like we used to do in sparring. We used to drop down, kick him in the groin and mm -hmm. stuff. We used to do that. So I go, look at that. And I get up and I said, and I go, that's what you do if you fall. So I kind of just covered up me slipping. And it, you know, at that time, I was young and you're teaching. And it's like, oh, that's kind of funny. And um, so it was tough, I think, at some times. But I, I think I didn't put that in my mind. I just put in my mind I was teaching because mm -hmm. I was, quote, the expert at the time, um, a new black belt and stuff like that. So even going into my school now, not so much now, but when I first opened my school in, in 95, I had people that were older than me that I was teaching. Sure. And um, by that time, it, it wasn't it wasn't so bad that I was comfortable. Um, but in those early years, yeah, it was it was different. Um, but I, I let my abilities kind of step forward and I mm -hmm. kind of made up for anything, any challenges. Sure. All right. So you go you graduate. You go into the military, you said you're 19. Yeah. Uh, another part of your path that seemed almost inevitable, the way you talked about it earlier. 
was martial arts on hold or were you fortunate enough to be somewhere that there were martial arts programs or maybe you were training on your own? I was training on my own mostly. There wasn't, um, I went into the military for a welder. I was a welder, uh, mm-hmm. which I wanted to do too. I liked doing things with my hands, like in shop class in school, like the mechanics and woodwork. And I liked doing that stuff. Um, so I went into boot camp. So there was no martial arts training there, except um, tra- you know, doing the stuff you have to do in boot camp. You don't have a lot of time. I do remember some weekends we didn't have much to do. I would go down in one of the empty rooms and practice. Uh, and there were a couple of people that did it, so I'd work out with them. Cool. Um, then when I moved on to the my schooling, the welding, again, it was not a whole lot of time, but weekends were easier. And um, the night after, after you get out of school, it was, you had free time. So you weren't, it wasn't like in basic training, like on the go all the time. So I did meet, um, I met this young man who was a little older than me. He um, he um, was in the military before, he was in the Marines, I think. He had just, um, he was on the tail end of Vietnam and stuff, so mm-hmm. he was young. And uh, he was probably a little older than me at the time, and he was a black belt, and um, I forgot what it was. Um, we just met and became friends, and... Um, we found some places off off base to train. There was this uh, again another Taekwondo school that we trained at. I think, and I remember going um, training with them and then going to some tournaments with them. So I did, there was training in there. And then my next step. So after schooling, we I was signed to a, a post. I went to Germany first, and um, and there um, I trained on my own. But then just going to the gym and working out and seeing people doing stuff. And some people were doing martial arts. So I became, I introduced myself and we started training. It was fun. We, um, a a couple guys, there was this, um, one guy that was a kickboxer. And, um, remember if you watched him from like outside, you just watched him when he's moving around, he, he wasn't really smooth. He was kind of like choppy and stuff. Mm -hmm. But when you actually get in and fought with him, it was a totally different, different thing. Hmm. These guys were big guys. They were, um, um, they were in different units. Uh, one guy big, they were like three big black guys. They were just huge. They were just really put together good and they had good backgrounds. One guy, I believe, um, I forgot his name, but I think he was from Detroit and, um, he was really skilled and he had, um, he was more aggressive, um, his style, I forgot what it was, but his philosophy, because he grew up in Detroit, um, like an in inner city, I believe, was like if if you came up to him and there was a, a you know, and he felt threatened or there was a, you know, there was a problem going on. Once if you were talking to him or threatening, him, once your hands went up here to he would hit you. That mm-hmm. was his philosophy because he had seen it happen many times and um and uh, and I had some issues too. When I went on, but I'll t- we'll talk about that after. Okay. Um, so his philosophy was that. So we trained. They had a boxing ring, so we trained in there and we sparred and stuff. It, it was it was fun. And then um, there was another guy I met. He was uh, in the barracks behind me. His father was. Uh, he did mudokwan, mm-hmm. I believe. His father was the head instructor of his system, so he was he was a medic and. Um, I met him through these same guys and um, he had a little, he did a little class in the barracks upstairs in one of the big empty rooms. So I would go there a couple nights a week and train. It was about six or seven after all, um, uh, mainly other um, soldiers and stuff, a couple females and stuff. So we were doing Mudaquan for a while. And then um, the funny thing we, um, and I did some more teaching there too, as well. I taught a couple classes there mm-hmm. uh, at the. Rec it sounds center. like it was it was rather collaborative. You know, yeah, kind of well, that was entirely uh, cross training. Yeah, so that was collaborative. And then um, with him, we uh, we did a couple tournaments. We went. I remember, and we almost didn't make it. So me, him, and and one of the the girl. It was I think it was his girlfriend at the time. We went to compete, and there was a tournament in Berlin. So he got a vehicle and um, I get the time off and we got our passes to go because you need passes to go pretty much different places. 
So we're driving to Berlin, and um, for some reason, he takes a wrong turn. We end up we end up at the border at like a, a checkpoint with the Russians and the Czech and the Czechs and stuff. So we pull up, and um, these guys with AK forty sevens are there, and they all look kind of mean. And uh, he gets out of the car, and we're talking. He's talking, and goes in, and then we have to wait because the MPs come. They take us. Mm-hmm. And, um, they bring us back to their barracks, and we had to stay the night because they were like mad at us and go, "Oh, well, we got lost. We took a wrong turn." And they finally let us go. And we finally make it to Berlin and stuff, and we compete. And um, you, you made it in time for the for the tournament. Yeah, yeah. We were. Couple, I think we we're a day. We started a day early, so we had time. Okay. And the tournament wasn't until a little later, so we made it, and um, <laughs> it was fun. We uh, had a little room in uh, like a bed and breakfast type thing. And um, I don't remember what happened at the turn at that tournament, but um, it was a good experience. It was fun to go and just to train and get back into tournaments at the time. Because all this time in the military, I'd been training a bit, but not as much as I was used to training. You know, I'd go to the gym and stuff because, you know, in Germany, there wasn't much to do. Um, well, there was a lot to do, um, but, you know, I didn't drink or anything, so it wasn't like going out and partying. I mean, we'd go out and dance in clubs and stuff, nothing crazy. But um, I still focus on my training and try to do as much martial arts as I could and remember everything. Um, so me hooking up with these people, training, even though it wasn't the stuff I was doing, katas and stuff, we were fighting and just training and just kind of building some of that camaraderie, and it was good. So it was a fun time for that. And, you know, if, if I'm remembering my, my dates correctly, you, you were stationed over there for a few years, you know, one, one contract, and then you, you were out four years. So I was there, um, 82, 84. So I was there from, um, like 84 to early 88. Yep. No, I'm sorry. Cause I was, I went to Germany well, I was like um, a year and a half to two years because I, I was in for four years in the military. So then after that, I went to Colorado. But um, so I was there for like a year and a half to almost two. And then um, during that time, as well as training with these other people, um, I had the opportunity. I don't know how it happened, but I started teaching at like the rec center, mm-hmm. like off post. Um to uh, military dependents. And uh, it was a good group. It was a bunch of kids. There was this one kid I remember. He, uh, he was young. He could do backflips and stuff. It was crazy. So I had this room, and I was teaching at, like, the, I think it was a rec center. But, again, it was um, it was for um, military dependents. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was doing that for a little while, and I would go there a couple nights a week and teach. I had um, friends. uh on posts that had cars that could drive me there or I would take a taxi. Um, um, so I would do that. And it was a good group. It was like maybe 10, 12 kids. I remember um, getting them ready. There was a karate tournament that we went to. Mm-hmm. And um, that was good. It was uh, it was an experience because we had to get a bus. And then um, and I didn't speak German, so it was hard to communicate to some of the people there were some people that could so we we made it through but it was a uh, we almost didn't get there because of the communication gap and um things not being you know they said they're going to give us a bus and it didn't happen it, it, it came late and all this stuff but overall the tournament was fun the kids uh, they did good there was all kinds of cool um people that i met uh, i remember this one sis, two sisters they were um i don't know where they were from but they had the red, white, and blue uniforms on. Mm-hmm. Remember the century ones, the thick mm-hmm. ones? They were um, these little Chinese girls. They were um, so adorable. They had long hair, ponytails, and they just, their, I remember their stuff was so, for young young kids, like um, it was, one was probably 10 or 12, and the other one was probably seven or eight. Um, they were really young, but, they move so good that the stuff was almost like flawless. It was just hmm. awesome to watch and stuff. And just that's why you do all the training and just seeing that. And um, yeah. 
it was just a good it was it was a fun day and a fun time i i want to i want to move forward a little bit in time because i want to make sure we get into this and i and i yeah. suspect that there's a little bit of a story here you you said you know you come out of the military you said you opened your school in 95 yes and no so this okay. one i had in 95 but prior to that um so like i said i was um so technically, I, I missed some his first black belt. Yep. And then I was the first one to open a school. So I opened that one in Hudson before I went into the military. Mm -hmm. So then when I came out, I'm work, I'm doing welding and stuff and still training, but I get laid off. So I'm stuck. I'm doing some work for him, this and that. So he had two, he did a lot of private lessons. He had two black belts. They were, uh, one worked for digital, which mm -hmm. is no longer around. And one was uh, a pilot. And um, he was a med, med pilot, I think. So they had some extra cash and they wanted to have a school where they could just go work out. They were black belts, but they weren't teachers. I mean, they could fill in and help me, but they couldn't really run the school. Sure. Um, so long story short, they put up the money and I opened a school in Merrimack, New Hampshire. So technically that was the first um, okay. Tokyo Joe's. I think at that time, that was right after um there was a big split in the organization of fred valaris mm -hmm. and um i remember miss lantina sitting us down and saying well mr valari had a meeting with him and he wanted um mr valari wanted miss lantina to run the whole east coast and um he said no he said well i'm gonna go on my own and da 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 da, da. so he opened up tokyo joe's so that school in merrimack was um the first Tokyo Joe franchise or Tokyo Joe's. So mm -hmm. I ran it for these two guys for several years. It must have been, um, I, I still can't remember the, the time date. I, I think it was like, so I opened this school in Nashua here at 95. So it must have been like 92 there. I opened that up. It was for a couple of years because I remember I, I promoted several black belts. Um, my cousins got black belts and I had a couple of the, I had like four or five other people that got black belts. So I had to been there at least um, two or three years yeah. to, to get that many black belts. So yes, coming here was 95. Okay. The, the reason I asked that is because the, the time gap uh, I was going to find surprising because it seems, seems in, in your history, no matter what happened, you found a way to teach. It just, you kept ending up with schools and teaching and, yeah. oh, I'll teach over here. And so this idea that it would take you five-ish years to open your school just wasn't clicking. So thank you for filling in that gap. Yeah. What was it like when you opened your own school? Because it, it sounds like 95, that's the first time where it was just you in a, let's call it a commercial or a professional sense. Yeah. Um, it was scary. I remember... So this school was in existence before I bought it. Um, a young lady was running it, and um, she had some black belts helping her, um, but it wasn't working out. Um, so um, Ms. Montana approached me, because I was in Merrimack at the time, and um, I wanted to buy that school. And um, one of the owners was making it really tough for me to buy it. I had mm. sat with my lawyer and she hooked me up with her banker. Uh, he was a president of one of the banks in Nashua. And we sat down and went over all the numbers. And he was saying, well, for the money they he wants you to pay for his half, it was like 30 grand. He said, it's not a good thing. I probably should have did it because I, I could have made it work. Um, but um, I didn't. And I went. So I came down here and I took over the school. And at the time it was ready to close. It was only had a handful of students and we were in a small space, like um, probably 1300, less than 1300 square feet, mm -hmm. one square room, uh, with a teeny office, a teeny waiting room and just a handful of students. And she was behind in the rent and stuff like that. So I just took it over and um, I just did what I did and just tried to make things work. And eventually it did. Um, we had, we had like probably 30 students at the time. It was just me. So um, there was no overhead and I didn't take a paycheck for a while. I just lived off what the school needed. I didn't have a, any other income other than that. And I still lived at home. So it wasn't, um, 
there were, I didn't have a big overhead. I had a mm -hmm. truck payment and that's about it. Um, so, um, from there, I just built up the school and worked on cleaning the school up and made some changes and just started being more consistent with the training. And slowly it grew and grew. And then the, the people, the owners of the, the plaza there, um, they moved me to another spot because they had, um, I think someone wanted my spot or they wanted to expand into my spot. And um, so the landlord said, hey, we're going to move you up to this spot. We'll pay for everything and you fix it up the way you want. And it was a little bit bigger. It was narrow, nice, long and narrow, like 1,300 square feet. And um, that's where I started. Hmm. And if you think back to, to that time, so I'm, I'm doing some math, um, late 20s, right, when you're doing this? Close yeah, to uh, yeah. Cause I got out, I went in the army, I got out of the army. I was like 24, 25. Um, yeah. So late twenties. Okay. And you've had plenty of, of experience teaching, seeing what other schools are doing and everything. What was it about you opening this school that you said, I'm going to make sure I do this or I don't do this. What was it in your vision that was really important? Um, well, I was always strong on the martial end, the business end, not so much. I mean, I, I could do it and, you know, I wasn't computer savvy or um, at the time, you know, I was shy about talking to people about signing up and stuff like that. So one of the, before I left the school in Merrimack, one of the owners sat me down, we were talking about things and he goes, you know, um, at the end of the day, don't worry about like paying the bills. I mean, they need to be paid and stuff. Don't worry about that. Do what you're good at and things will work. And what I was good at was teaching and the martial arts part. So I just kind of adapted that philosophy and things started getting better. I mean, I, I did my office stuff. I did that stuff, but I focused on teaching and the curriculum and things like that. And that was my strength or my superpower, whatever you want to call it. And, and things started to grow. And every time in my career now, when I kind of step back from that philosophy, that's when I then things start to struggle a little bit. So I always try to do what I can on the floor and do my best there. And then things have a way of working out. Because for me, um, like everyone takes time off and vacation. Hey, I need uh, time off. To get for me, training is my outlet. Like I have a friend that Sunday, he doesn't do anything. He home with the wife and the dogs and whatever they do and they hang out and they do things for them. They don't do any training or any business stuff for me. Like Sunday, one Sunday I'm training here, one Sunday I'm training mm -hmm. there. That's my release training. And like um, when I train on Fridays, one Friday I'm in dairy, one Friday I'm with Terry and yeah. Jesse and all of those guys. That's my, my release time. That's my me time. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I like taking time off. But sometimes if I get too much time on my hand, then I start getting antsy and I don't do things. So I have to be more active and moving. Sure. So, But when I do the consulting work that I do, the two places that I find the biggest problems are people so focused on the business side of things that they're not investing in the quality of the instruction yeah. on the floor or the owner, chief instructor, whoever it is I'm working with has lost their passion. Yeah. If I, if both, if, if the, the ownership is not passionate and making sure there's quality instruction happening on the floor, nothing else matters. Yeah, you're right. Cause that's where we make our money on the floor. Um, and for me, it's important because I'm a one man show. When I had uh, someone help me, it was good, but um what happens with that sometimes, and this, this guy was really good. He came, he was with me since he was 11. He was one of my, he was uh, like the highest bell I had a fifth degree. Mm -hmm. So he was, you know how, how are things done, but then everyone has their own little way of doing things. So he might do something team bit different than I want. And when he's teaching class, I'm doing something else. So I'm not really watching that. So there's a little challenge there to make sure everyone's on the same page. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's an important thing, making sure everyone is on the same page or close to it. Um, 
one of the things that we used to talk about in some of our meetings is like 80%, the 80, 20% rule. That's it's even a business thing. So for us, what that meant is on our lesson plans, or say we give you a lesson plan. Okay, you got to do 80% of this lesson plan. The other 20% you can add your own flavor into. Mm -hmm. uh, just like when I was being taught, I would, Mr. Lamartine would show me how he does it. I learned his flow and his movement. As I start learning it and then I get better at it, I add my stuff into it. Um, so same thing with the teaching. He, when I teach kids or help teach people how to teach, like especially my junior leaders, trying to teach them how I do things. And then as they get better and they get more responsibility, then they can add their own personalities into it and stuff. And I believe that's probably the best way to teach someone how to teach. You got to start somewhere. Hmm. Completely agree. Yeah. Now, given, given that you've been operating the school, I mean, we're, coming up on 30 years, right? Yeah, uh, September 15. will be um, 28, I yeah. think 28. What, if if we were to have a time machine and you know I could go back and I could train in your school in 95, I, I could train in your school now, would I notice anything different? Um, probably, um, I've toned down a teeny bit on how I am with the, the students I and I, and I um it was a little challenge because I always um I was struggling a little bit where um I want the students to be like me mm. and then in, I don't, what, in what way what, what does that mean um I want I wanted them to train like me and why they didn't you wanted them to be as passionate as you were yeah and um so I had a long talk with like my office manager and some other people, but, um, so that's a good thing, but they're not me. Like, um, when I trained, I did it all the time. So maybe I trained 200 hours a year or whatever that was. And now, now if you figure it out, the time, the classes, now they're training maybe 80 hours a, a year or a month or however that works out. I can't remember the formula, but, um, so for a while, I wanted them to be like me, and I, and I struggled with that sometimes. But then after I thought about it and talked to people, I go, well, they're not me, so I have to figure out how to get to them for them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a big difference, the way um, they trained when, when I started. Um, it wasn't that I was really militant or anything like you talked about before. I, I consider myself in the middle. I'm not super strict but i like to have fun with the kids especially the kids i like to have i like the classes to be enjoyable not like too strict right. or too fun because you got to ride the middle and that's a hard thing to do sometimes because you have parents well i want my kid disciplined okay well then you, when you discipline them oh that's too much discipline okay well i'm gonna be a little softer well you're too soft on the kids well you gotta make up your mind right. so the word the word coming to mind is structured yeah. It sounds like your classes are structured without being militant. Yeah. So I have to run that middle line point, And that's always a hard thing to do sometimes. So I think what's different now is before I was probably a little more firmer on some of the kids and the classes were different. Now they're getting there. They're I'm getting back to where, yeah, I want the classes. I want the higher belts. They're pushing them. They're doing their stuff. Like last night, we did some teen classes, and um, they must have did um, I don't know, a uh, hundred slide and side kicks on the bags. You know, sets of ten at the end of class, um, and they were, you know, they started out slow, but by the end, they were finishing the way it should be—a nice clean snap kick. You know, a nice side slide and side kick when you're fighting, because it was a uh, stuff on fighting last night, sparring. So we sort of sparring, we worked on some of the tools. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's. What it's gonna that's what you would see. Um my passion's still there. Um, but the classes are they're still hard, but they're not as, you know, I'm probably not as hard on them like yelling and screaming. I'm I'm toned down a bit with that, but we're still we're still getting the training that they need. Great, nice. Okay. And I guess one one more question. This isn't a question that I often ask, but you've been 
you've been teaching and training for a long time and you've seen a lot of evolution. And, and because I know some of the elements in your history that we haven't talked about, you know, we don't need to go into them, but I know you've watched a number of transitions occur. Yeah. When you think about the martial arts world today, as, as you see it, mm-hmm. what you're exposed to versus what you started with, you know, I think a lot of people could say, oh, I think we used to do this better. I think we do this better now. Just as I asked you to compare your school now versus your school then, how would you compare and contrast martial arts now to martial arts in 1982? Um, well, I think um, uh, there's probably more camaraderie. Um well, that's a kind of a two-part question. So outside of the schools, there's more camaraderie. Um, inside, like, um, we became friends. Um, we worked so close together. Um, I have, I still have a friend. He has a school in Merrimack. You know, I he remembers the first day when he seen me. I was a higher belt than him. He was just coming in. He just remembers him seeing me going down to the floor doing those sliding sidekicks I was telling you about. And that's in his mind because every time we talk or and we're talking to other people, oh, yeah, I met this guy here. You know, when, he, when I come to teach his classes and help him out, he goes, oh, yeah, I, this guy here, this is Kyoshi. And I met him. This, and you could see him doing these kicks. So mm-hmm. that camaraderie is still there and it's there now. Um, so what's the different part is – the interaction between other schools back in the eighties, we didn't have that much. I told you the thing we did with Mark West and Monkai, mm-hmm. that was few and far between. Yeah. The only I reason back then. is because Miss Lumetane and Mark West, they knew each other mm-hmm. and they probably hung out and went out. They, 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 they were older. So they just knew, they knew of each other mm-hmm. and they had repetitions. So they kind of like, okay, instead of beating each other up, we're going to kind of have this kind of friendship. Sure. Um, so with that, you had that, but now the interaction of schools and stuff, um, there's a lot more of that. So that's a big difference there because you can, you can go to someone's school and not have a problem. <laughs> you, you know, you're it's not assumed that you're showing up to steal students yeah, or cause yeah. problems. And the thing I see um, with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it's, it's more, I think it's there, it's there their custom there because the way they they are the brazilians mm-hmm. um i remember going, the first time going down to henzo gracie school in new york um i've never met him um my instructors bring me down there they know him and i mean yeah, i'd seen him on tv and i might have met him at a seminar years ago but um i had a book with me he signed i um one of his books i had a bunch of the black belt sign it it was just why wow, i was like awesome but I remember him coming up to me, shaking my hand and saying, I think he used my name, Eric, this is your school. This is your home. You know, relax. We're here. This is your your home. This is your, you're welcome here. Sure. And um, back in the 80s, you never got that from a karate school. No. Now, now I do. I mean, with the people I train with and stuff, like with, with Jesse and Terry and all those guys, it's like, brother, this is your house. This is, you know, you relax, you do what you need to do. And, you know, we're here for you and stuff like that. When, so when I go into those places, so that's a big difference there. Hmm. Now you probably don't see that at every school, but when no, you, but it's, it's a lot more common. Yeah. Sure. When you have a relationship with some of these guys, like Jesse, I've known for years. Um, I don't know how we met. I think we met at Henry's uh, or on the gateway, I mm-hmm. believe. And, um, he would come every once in a while. Tim would have seminars at his school where people would come in or just him and all these people would come and he would be one of them. Mm -hmm. Um, So having these kind of connections, the bonds are just and and like meeting Terry and Craig. I've known Terry for a long time. Craig, I didn't know until I started training up there. Um, And I knew Joe and stuff like that. But just the connection that me and Craig had and just all of us had, like I'm coming into the group new and it's like, I've been there for years and Hey brother, let's, Hey, you're welcome. Let's, let's get together. Let's do this. Let's do that. And, um, so that's, a, I think that's a big difference right there. Hmm. 
that you're going to see. You don't you don't see that all the time. Now it's probably more so. But again, it's going to be. I don't want I don't want to use the word clicks, but it's going to be the people you're close to. That's what you're going to have that to. And then when you start meeting people, if you click and you get comfortable with each other and you have that that vibe and you click, then that's going to be like that. Hmm. Makes sense. It's like I met um, when I meet Peter Friedman. I don't know if you know who hmm. Peter Friedman is. I do. So I met him. Where did I meet him? So I trained with Mike and May Williams. Do you know who they are? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I trained with them. I've been training with them off and on for a while. I do privates with them. So I go to uh, Jesse's having a, one of his black belt tests. So his testing is like five days long. So you do a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday. There's always a seminar that everyone has to go to. And he brings up his Rudy Duncan comes up and then he brings other people up. So one year Peter was there and I had um, um, Mike and May's shirt on. And, um, and I had met Peter once before or I had seen him. I can't remember um, if this is the first time I met him. Um because he did come to a, a cookout or a dinner with the Amok stuff with Tom Sotis. So I, I can't remember what was first, but um, so I think it was Jesse's was first, but he seen my shirt. He came over, shook my hand and it was like, Oh man, it's like we knew each other for a long time. Yeah. He was just so, and he's another one of those guys. Like when I told you about um, Mr. Glenn, when I talked to him on the phone first, it was like, and even I didn't talk to him personally. I heard his, his voicemail. It was like, his voice was so relaxing and hey, come to my school and and I'm gonna teach you. Peter was just like that. It was just he was so down to earth. You you look at him how good he is and how talented he is and what he's capable of doing. Same thing with like Mr. Sotis. You don't think you can approach these guys um, unless you know him really good. But like Peter was like, hey, thank you, man. You know Mike and May? Yeah. Oh, you're my friend. Now. And it's like we're connected. Yeah. And then, um, so I think that's a big thing right there. You don't see that as much, but now it's starting to be more. And again, like you said, it's not going to be all the time as it'll be with certain people. Totally. Hmm. So what's next for you and for your school? If we get together, you know, five years from now, we record part two, you know, what, what would you be telling me? Um, well, I, um, I want to improve. I um, I guess it starts with me, so I got to improve me, um, my training. I do training, but I need to be more consistent with it. I got to get on a better schedule. So, me training, and then moving the school forward. Um, not necessarily more students, but I'd like to get a handful more. I'm at. I'd like to get you know, two hundred students would be good. You know, I'm a little shy of that. It's a great, um, it's a great number. It's a number very few schools ever achieve. Yeah. Um, but more so, I, I want to impact the students I have here and impact my community. I don't do, a, I haven't done a whole lot outside the community as much. I mean, I do little things um, compared to some other schools um, where it's me, just a one man show. It's, it's tough to do some of those things to spread yourself. I find myself sometimes doing too much and spreading myself too thin mm -hmm. and then it doesn't work. And I, I don't want to do something halfway. I want, if I'm going to do something, I want to make sure it works and it's right. So moving forward, you know, I want to build a school and impact the people I have here and give them something that they can take with them into the future when they move on, mm -hmm. whether they stay with me or they grow up and get a job, go to college, have a family. I want them to, um, and still, I want to instill those morals and values I try to do. And I'm not perfect. I mean, we do our best we can, like anyone. Sure. And then, so that's for the students. Outside the school, I want to, I love to impact the community. I, um, I women's self-defense programs, I do stuff like that. But more so just be a positive force in the community. And I, I, I've never really stepped out like that. So it's something I have to figure out how to do and where to start and you know, small things. So I don't do too much. Again, again, it's just me. So I have to, um, and I have help from other people, my office manager and stuff, but more so I'm doing a lot and that kind of stuff would be me and my team helping me out and stuff. But, um, so that's where I want to go with that. And then just, again, my training and just 
elevate my for my personal um fulfillment just to take my martial arts to another level not necessarily learn new things like when i was a kid um and i always thought when i got a black belt this light would come open up and it would be like ah and it would be you would have all the answers but but um that's not how it works you don't have you don't have all the answers and, and people think well black belt's the end but it's not it's the beginning of your training you you think anything under your black belt all the stuff you learn is just the basics the fundamentals the core skills or whatever you want to call them and you build off that i uh, remember watching a video that really um i really liked i don't know if it's stood the test of time i watched it i think before and it wasn't as cool but um the warrior within it was uh, a tribute to bruce lee and chuck norris was narrating it have you ever mm. seen that i don't so, think i have it's called the warrior within check it out I, I i don't know if if it's if it stood the test of time but um so he's interviewing all these karate masters they're karate masters but they're all um first second degrees third degree black belt so they're not you know, like in our system, if you get a fifth degree, you can call yourself a master. Mm -hmm. So they're not typically, they're not, I don't think I've seen any 10th degree black belts in there, but they were all second and third degree and stuff like that. And they're doing different martial arts. But the, the thing I got from that and what resonates with me and it's important to me is it's not about your rank. It's not about how much stuff you have. It's about taking what you have and elevating when you get the black belt. So that, I get my first degree. Now I'm up here. And what I need to do is take all this stuff and elevate it up to where I want to be, where I can do my stuff in my mind. Uh, a good black belt is be able to do your stuff without really thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And, and I look at my stuff and I get so much stuff. So it's, it's hard. Sometimes you have to kind of segregate stuff and, and block it out. Okay. I'm going to work on this. I'm going to work on this. I'm going to work on that. And I look at my stuff, like I, at fifth degree, I stopped collecting forms. So at fifth degree, I just, I'm done in taking forms. I'm going to just take what I have and practice them. Because I have what, under black belt, we had, um, to get our black belt when I was younger, we needed to do um, 11 forms. Mm -hmm. One to five kata, one to five pinion, and for us called stature of the crane. So it's 11 forms. So over the years, I'm teaching that, and some of the kids can pick it up, but some can't. So I just cut it down. They get one to five kata. But so I had those ten forms. Then I all the black belt forms that I have now. So it was it seven or eight of them? So what's that like? Twenty forms right there. That's a lifetime. That's a lot master. of forms. That's a life to, to get good at that stuff and practice it and make it applicable and just make it flow. That's like a lifetime of stuff. You can't do you, there's so much stuff there i couldn't practice it every day and it, if i did it would take me all day to do all those forms and put the time in so at fifth grade i said well i'm just gonna not collect any more forms i got enough i don't need any more i like the ones i have so let's start with those and then if i want more later so it's it's a matter of not collecting so much stuff but taking what i have so like when I got the black belt, all the, the, the lights didn't come on and it was like, okay. And I, and watching that video just kind of, you know, these guys are second or third degree black belts and they're, they're masters in what they do because they take one thing or they take what they're doing and they master it. They don't, they're not doing 20 different things. Now that's not to say cross trainers because I do other different styles, but, um, just like like core stuff or just getting good at what you already have, not necessarily learning other stuff. So um, I lost my track of what we're talking about, but that's okay. Uh, that's what I see from my martial arts mm -hmm. and the business going forward. I, and I, and some of the time the challenges I have or the things that come up with me is um, I'm passionate about my students. I, I just want the best for them. So when I see challenges or they're having a hard time or they're not putting their effort in, I, I, I take it personal sometimes and I can't because they're not me. They're not, I, I can't get in that mindset. Well, they didn't 
they're not doing what I did. And I, I can't do that. And it took me a long time to, to come across that and figure that out. Um, and I'm better for it now because I'm more relaxed with the kids. Um, you know, I'm not hard on them, but I'm not easy on them. I mean, there are some kids you need to be a little harder on because they need that. But um, for the most part, I enjoy what I'm doing. And I, just like any other job, I, I enjoy, you know, there's always good days and bad days, but I, the good days outweigh the bad days. And I'd rather have a, a bad day on the mat is probably better than most bad days anywhere else. So as long as I, you asked me about my training, as long as I, I need to do that. I need to train. Like you were talking, you know, some people let this slide and do this, but you're right. We, we make our money is on the floor and our skills need to be able to teach and stuff. So that's where I, I want my stuff so I can show it to my students so they can see me doing it so they can do it. Well said. And it, it really does take us to the end and not that you haven't already said plenty of stuff that I think we could fit into this category, but I, I want to let you end how you want to end. So final words to the audience today. Um, well, for me, for the martial arts speaking, um, if you're into martial arts, just find your passion and train, um, and do what your body tells you to do. As we get older, there's stuff I don't do that I used to do. When I was younger, I could do a lot of jump, spin and back kicks and stuff like that. I, I still do some, but not as much. Mm -hmm. um, so as we get older, you want to find different ways to train. The ways you train when you're younger are probably not the ways you want to keep training now because um, our bodies are different. So we have to think about that. Um, when you are training, you want to give it all you got, but you don't want to empty your gas tank. You want to probably leave like 20% in there. So you can get up the next day, go to work, train more. Cause if you empty your gas tank and then you can't work or train the next day, then that's not a good thing. And that's where the injuries come in. That's how you get hurt. Um, so with that part with the training, do what you think works for you. Find what works for you. You got to find those things. You can look at, you can compare yourself. Oh, this guy does this. This guy does that. Oh, I want to do that. Well, maybe you can, maybe you can't. Maybe he's 10 years younger than you. That's why he's doing that. Like for me, my flexibility is I've lost a little bit of flexibility and I got to start trying to work that back. I don't know if I'll get to where I used to be, but I'm going to try that. Um, so as for the martial arts part, that's what I, that's what I would say with that. As for the business part, um, do what you're strong in. Um, like I said, we talked about the floor. That's an important part, doing our training, but how to manage the floor. When I was coming up, we would do seminars and go to different business things. A lot of it was on um, teaching mm -hmm. and training. Um, and most of the martial arts, at least at my time, None of us had college education. Some did, but we learned the hard way. I mean, I remember, um, like I told you before, I had to figure out how to prep myself for teaching. So it was the first part was getting training and doing all the my shots, learning the weapons. The second part, my instructor had these manuals he bought from Andrew Wood. This was years ago. They were, um, and I still have them, and they're probably a little out of date, but they still um, they hold true. One was how to make $100,000 a year teaching martial arts. It just went from A to Z on how to set up your school advertising. And again, you know, yellow pages and stuff. So it's probably a little out of date. There's probably stuff that's a little more updated. But I remember getting all those books and reading them. So that was my college education because I didn't go to college. i not super book smart. But that's what I did. I read all those. And then other manuals I picked up over the years. Um Different people I've seen, like Tom Callos, um, Dave Kovar, those are the people. When I started meeting, I go, geez, I want to be like those guys. They're like teaching teachers, and I wanted to do stuff like that. Um, so I got any book that I could. I remember um, there was a company, I don't know if it's still existent, Turtle Press. It mm -hmm. was, um, I think they're from Connecticut or somewhere. Um, I forgot the instructor's name, but he wrote several books and one of the best books I got, I still have it somewhere. I don't know if it's with me today. Uh, 
it was like the best 20 bucks I spent. It was, um, teach, I think the title was, um, teaching the martial arts or the way of the martial arts, but it was a book, a manual, just like I talked about with, um, uh, Andrew Wood and stuff, but it was just, it was on teaching. It was how to do lesson plans, um, attributes of the martial arts, mm -hmm. um, and, and all these cool things. And it just, that helped me so much. And it was like the best 20 bucks I spent. It helped me figure out how to do lesson plans and things like that. So, um, that's what I would say, you know, if you're going to be in, if you're going to run a school, if you are running it, then you probably already know all that, but search out people that are above you. Like in jujitsu, they say, we need three people to train with. You need someone that's below you, someone that's with you at your level and someone above you. Um, so I take that in everything we do, any martial arts, you, you need that because that's how you're going to get better in any business. You're going to need it. You need people that are equal to your level that are going to push you. Now, maybe some pe in business people below you. So you keep your mind. So you know where you came from. You don't get like, I'm better than anyone else. And then the people above you, Hey, I want to inspire to be like that. Um, I want to, now maybe I can't be like that, but I want to inspire like that. I want to look at his path. He did this and this and this. Well, I can't keep compete with him, but I, I can follow and, and, and learn his ways and, and maybe take one or two things from him and get better. So that's how I would, uh, that's what I would say about that. Wasn't that a great episode? I hope you enjoyed it. I did. And I, I got the sense that Kyoshi Eric also enjoyed it. So, Hey, at the very least, the two of us did, and you probably did as well. Now, if you want to go deeper, you want to see the stuff that we talked about in the episode, go to the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And I want to thank Yoshi Minard for coming on the show. Thank you so much. And I know we'll talk again, and I'll see you soon. Audience, do you have a martial arts school, or do you have the ear of your martial arts instructor? Have you heard them say, man, I wish we just had a few more students. Oh, you know, just a few more dollars at the end of the month would really make a difference for us. We can help you with that. We do it already for a number of martial arts schools. We can do it for more, including you. And you should reach out. There's a section on our website at whistlekick.com. You go to the school owner section. You go to the consulting page. It's going to tell you everything you need to know. Or you could just reach out to me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. The other thing you might consider is hosting me and some of my friends for a seminar. We'll come out to your school, no matter where you are. We'll come do it. We'll have a blast work on some stuff, have some fun, go to dinner. Sounds like a good time, doesn't it? If you want to follow us on social media, we are at Whistlekick on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, where else? All kinds of places. If you can think of it, we're probably on there. And that takes us to the end. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.